Okay, this talk is about the SAT solver and basically the algorithms behind it, um, which is actually not really the reason why the new code is so fast, but the real reason is the different repository uh, handling. But this is a rather boring topic. The interest, more interesting topic is the solving part, so I'm talking about the solver here. So, first of all, what was the issue with the old solver? I mean, it just got replaced for 10.1, and now we're replacing it again. What, what on earth happened? What? So, basically, it turned out that it was just too slow. It was written, it was the old solver from the Red Carpet project. It was um, basically written so that a um, company can keep their workstations up to date. So it was written with a mindset that there is one update, small update repository that they call the channel in Red Carpet, which you subscribe to. And then the solver just always installs the newest version of one package. So when we used it, for complete installation, especially with the build service where we have 10 or 20 repositories added, it just broke down. Um, so we really had cases where solving took several minutes. So that's why in the code we disabled some things like um, when the, the original red carpet solver um, branched at every alternative and tried every solution and then had a, a metric and chose the best solution at the end. But this turned out that we couldn't do that with so many packages. In OpenSUSE has about 10,000 packages and it, it, we had 10 minutes or so. So part of that code got disabled very fast. But then of course you don't have an optimal solution in such case, in cases. And the other problem we had, it really could get stuck. It could, there were, there were times when it couldn't find a solution, just hung it, <coughs> probably due to bugs, we never found out exactly what was going on there. So the Yast team actually implemented a timeout, that, will, <laughs> that after a couple of minutes we'll get a request, something's wrong, <laughs> do something different, I can't help you with that solving, <laughs> so that they, there's smoother feedback. Another issue we had, we did that extension, extension with the weak dependencies, so where we have recommended packages and suggested packages, and the idea behind the recommended packages is um, that they basically get installed when it's possible. But as the code was pretty fixed at the moment, from because we took it over from a carpet, it was really it didn't integrate well into it. So basically, the server more or less treated treated recommended packages like required packages. So it it couldn't go back and deselect the recommended packages and then branch on something else because then it also the code would... But yeah, are you okay talking about the zip now or the current project? Uh, that's basically for 10.1 and 10.2 it's the same. The libsub <coughs> we took over the solver from red carpet. Mm -hmm. So the red carpet code was written in C, it was put to C++ and put into libsub, but the algorithms are the same. Okay. Yeah, another thing which really annoyed the users is the bad diagnostics. So if a, a problem, a user election turned out to be unsolvable, then you got a retester telling you that libfubar requires a dependency bar, and but none of the providers can, can be installed. And you, you think, gosh, what's that? I never requested libfubar. Why is it telling me something about libfubar about that other package installed? So, so the user just doesn't know what to do with that. And the, and the, so the suggestion the solver did was um, don't install libfuba or break libfuba. The user doesn't know what, what libfuba does and why it's there. So this is also oh, great. Why the thing that the new solver will do very, very much better than the old solver. Speaking about the new solver, why on earth is it called SAT? That's because it's a and it's named after a standard um, a problem from the algorithmic folks. It's called the Boolean satisfiability problem, which basically is that you have got a big Boolean expression with some variables in it, and 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 or or not. And the job is 
the algorithm must find a solution for the problem. A solution is defined as find a assignment for the, all the variables so that the resulting expression is true. So this is actually uh, NT complete, so this is a hard problem um, when, the, when the clauses are the, when the expression here is, is not very trivial, it's, it's NP complete. So what you normally do with such projects problems and what you also do with the algorithms you do some sort of search with the tracking. Of course, easy thing, easy preprocessing is normal, normalization. So you have the big expression and you normalize it so that uh, it all the expression now has this form, this is um, some some variables with or in it and then and then of course you can have a negation here and you and all um, terms here are, are connected with an and. So this is normalization form. Here's an example. You have uh, A or B or C and not C and uh, not A or C is true and the uh, solution would be or set A to false, set B to true, set C to false. Because then this is true, this term is true because of the B, this is true because of the C, and the last term is true because of the A. So this is the solution. Normally there are multiple solutions for a problem, but I'll come to that later. What to do there. What are the advantages here of this of the using the sub algorithm? The very big advantage is very well research problems with lots of papers and lots of people, intelligent people have thought about how to do that really, really fast. There are very, very good algorithms out in the, out there that to solve such problems. An example could be Chaff. Chaff was a very good solver which, which introduced some special things to make it fast and Minisub is pretty much state of the art. And Actually, my code is, is based algorithm-wise on the Minisat solver. So it's really, really fast because it's researched that well. Actually, the good thing is, for the SAT forks, package solving is basically trivial. There's yearly um, competitions where the solving algorithm compete against each other, where they have ex millions of rules and, and thou hundred thousands of variables and so our little dependency problem is for them so so small a problem. So the SAT code use, we we have normally uses um, solves the problem in milliseconds. So it, they, they don't even bother about thinking about that. Their their problems are solved in minutes or so or hours. So it's really not that not hard to solve dependencies. The code uh, the algorithm is pretty easy to understand. If you know about the come from the SAT, uh, if you read, read some papers or so, the algorithms are very basic, and, and I show you later on some of the main things how solving is done. So it's not hard to understand. And if I look, it's just a couple of hundred lines of code. Whereas the old red carpet solver used to the chip was a couple of thousand of code, so it's about ten times less code to understand. And that's that's good because if it's the community is working on it. With ten thousands of lines of code, it's, it's hard to find people to, to, re to really dig into that code and understand what's going on. With just hundreds of lines of code, people will contribute to it. And of course, as I said, the algorithm gives you a nice little, if there's unsolvable, it gives you really good um, suggestions how the problem can be turned into a solvable problem. So. This is also much better than in, with red carpet. So let me start and like, digging more into the depth, into it how how the normal de package dependencies are turned into a sub problem. Um, say we have a package A and A has one dependency that it requires um, dependency B and B gets provided by packages B1, B2, and B3. So the idea is now that. This can be transferred into the following rule. As you can remember, the rule, all rules must be true, and uh, all the terms and the rules are uh, connected with OR. So the rule is it's either A is not installed, or one of the three packages here is installed. This is exactly what the requires also says. If it's installed, then we need one of those, otherwise, I'm okay with it. 
Same with conflicts. Um, if I have a conflict dependency, A well, multiplies by conflicts with B, and B again is provided by B2, obviously, but my transfer uh, is then three words from that, namely um, minus A or not A or not B, B1. So this is true if either A is not installed or B1 is not installed but just only false if both are installed. And that's exactly what the conflict says. We must install A and B1. And the second one is the same. You must install A and B2, and you must install A and B3. Um, obsoletes pretty much work the same way. Normally, the, if for installed packages, they are ignored, but for uninstalled packages, obsoletes are, tre are treated as conflicts because the server doesn't know what to do if you select a package A for installation and A was not installed before, so like B before uh, into installation and B is not installed before and if A and B obsolete, now, now what is the result? If it, if it first installs A and then B, um, then both packages will be installed, but if it first installs B and then A, then the other one is obsoleted, so it's, it's undefined, so it's not treated as conflict because actually they can't exist very well in the system together. If the other package is already installed, then of course obsolete is, is ignored and then it also works. That's actually, that's for obsoletes that are really direct, directly in the package, but of course there are also indirect obsoletes, namely packages with the same name. If you have, if you have some package A, which has a version 1, with another package uh, A, which has version 2, you can't install both because they obsolete each other more or less. So if, if I would install it with minus, minus U with RPM, then the other package would be done. So it's also packages with the same name also get those uh, conflict rules here. This is, of course, where you can do special casing because in SUSE, normally, if you have a kernel, then in the new patch comes in and secure adapter for a kernel, it doesn't uh, automatically deinstall the old kernel. So Wherever you would special case, you would just drop the rules for those special cases. But normally, you will have you want to obsolete um, packages with the same name. You want to conflict. Sorry, you want to conflict those. So there are also unary rules. These are basically special cases when when there is no nothing that provides a requirement. Then of course the, we will have a unary rule not, not, that is here not a which just says to the subsolver, package A can't be installed. So this can either be because that is provided, or maybe it's a request from the outside. This is where the user interface comes in. When um, the user selects um, erase the package, then this rule gets added so that the solver doesn't install it because the user wants to erase. Same with installation. If the user clicks on once the package installed, then what really happens down in the uh, machine is that a um, unary rule is just a package gets added, which says to the sub algorithm, as this must be true, A must be installed. Yeah, true is installed and false is packages don't install the package, so it's previously was installed, uninstalled it. Uh, if you have Questions about something, just don't hesitate to ask me. Now, some slides about how the solving works, and then I show you what that means for dependencies. So, the solving algorithms, the main uh, algorithm is this unit propagation. And this is a special uh, word from the subforks. The rule is exactly called unit when all literals but one are false. And the special thing is, if it's unit, then the last literal must be true. So, here's again the example. Say, this is false because it's an assertion, so C must be false, it's easy to see because the complete expression must be true, so C must be false. Then this rule over here is unit, C is false, as it's only one literal left, this one must be um, true, that means A must be false. 
And then we have a look here. We have um, C was false because of this one. Um, A was also false. This rule is also unit. So B must be true. So we have a solution for this problem with unit propagation. And the complete solving algorithms work like this. Works like, like this. If there's nothing for propagation, we <coughs> do a free choice. So we pick some undecided variable, assign basically a random value. This is all first this part is basically heuristics. And then the next step is propagate all rules that are now unit. And if they have nothing more to propagate, if no rule is unit any longer, then continue with the first step. And do this as long as you have um, assignment for the variables and then you found a solution. Now you, of course you're thinking, oh, this is stupid. Uh, picking some random variable won't work, won't help us very much. But here's where you, where you um, program the direction the solver should take. So here's where you, you have a program that the solution must be minimal, must change a minimal number of packages or, or must update as, as good as possible. So this is where you can program your goals and the, this is what's forced about this unit propagation is that what, what's forced from the dependencies from the RPMs. But I'll come to that later too. I can want to show you what unit propagation is if you think about RPM dependencies. So a requires rule say this rule is unit. That means all must be true except one. Now if, uh, say, B3 is the one that is uh, not unassigned yet and all other is false, that means A is uh, false, no, A is true, B1 is false and B2 is false. And the propagation says B3 must be true. But that's basically what you'd expect because this is just, if I put that into a sentence, if A is installed and B1 and B2 are not installable, then I must install B3. So if, if, if I have a dependency and a, for a package that is installed and all my alternatives are, like, are just reduced to one left that are installable, then I must take that alternative. So this is actually very easy to understand. So what this does, it adds packages to the set of installed packages. This is basically how every other solver also works. It checks dependencies that are unsolved and if it's more than one alternative it may try branching or try something different but if just one package left to install it chooses that one. And this other thing is if um, A is undecided and this is what, what the normal solvers normally don't do if A is still left and the others are, for, are false so if none of all, if all the providers of the dependencies can't be installed a also can't be installed. This is normally what the, the solvers don't do. So this adds packages to the list of uh, conflicts or this is a set of conflicts or set of uninstalled. So this says this rule says uh, if those are forbidden for installation, then A must also be forbidden for installation. This, so this is very nice to have because it it broadens the set of packages that this one broadens the set of packages that are that are installed, and this one runs packages, list of packages that are conflicting or must be installed. Well, conflict rules are of course easy to understand if, if a conflict rule is if A conflicts with B, then if A is true, that means A is uh, not installed, no, if A is true, that means A is installed, but that means B1 uh, must be false and thus uninstalled. This is pretty straightforward. <coughs> So, of course, if you normal solving algorithm, you probably know you sometimes get contradictions. Same is true with the um, SAT solving. The unit propagation can lead to contradictions. Here's an example. Um, you have this rule, this expression, and maybe the SAT solver chose to install A. So, this is rule is unit, so we know B is true. This rule is unit because A is true, so now C is also true, and then 
we have this rule that tells us B conflicts with C, but we just established that we have to install both B and C, so this is a contradiction. So, what happens is that the subsolver algorithm then um, check, learns from all the rules that was involved, that were involved with the contradiction, and learns a new rule and adds this new rule, this is so called learned rule, to the set of rules. In this case, it's very easy. The learned rule is just I can't install A because then we get this contradiction. But the learned rule can actually contain any numbers of uh, literals with uh, nots and as they can be, they can be more complex than this one. And if I can't go back, if I can't undo all steps, then of course the complete program is unsolvable. In this case, I could go back because this was all the contradiction was also the, only there if A was set to true. So I could um, undo the steps that led to the contradiction and then continue the solving. And the idea of Learned rules was a major breakthrough for the subforks and the patent in 1969 and was first implemented in the GRASP solver. And this is really what makes the solving reliable, so that's really always, if there is a solution, then the subsolver will find it. So, otherwise it will return um, a proof by the, by the unsolvable. So it's, it's the code is really reliable because of this. And doesn't get stuck somehow, or doesn't get stuck in an endless loop like the old server did. So, so it's not only faster, but also more reliable. Yeah. Cool. <coughs> Much. Everything better than the old. <laughs> no, but it's, it's really it's surprising actually when you know the algorithm that, that uh, the other solvers like, like Smart or, or Yum or so don't use it algorithm because it's, it's easy to implement and it's fast and it works really, really well. Okay, but anyway, Suse must lead. That's why one, one part of Suse can lead the development. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> okay, but coming back to the free choices, here is where really where you can direct the solver on what, what, the, what the aim is from the solving. So you, Normal goal is try to keep packages that were installed installed, so erase as, as um, less packages as possible, and also minimize the number of packages that get added, because you want you, the user doesn't want um, the, um, the changes that don't need to be done. And the algorithm I implemented to do this is pretty easy. First of all, if there's a free choice, it checks if there are packages that were installed before and are not yet set to install, then it chooses those. So this is the first step. We try to keep all packages installed that already were installed. Of course, that de depends on what the goal is. If your goal is to um, always um, have the newest version installed, you would change this to, if a package was installed, try to install the newest version. So this here can tell how the solver should behave. And the other part is that uh, it's dealing uh, with how to find a minimal, minimal solution. If we have rules that are not yet true, of course if rules are true, I don't even want to look at it anymore, and all negative literals are false, then I can choose from the positive literals any packages with some metric, maybe the best version, normally the best version, and install it. So in here with our um, example, if A is true, then I have this I have an unfulfilled dependency, so I have to choose between B1 and B2, and I um, chose the normally choose the package with the highest version, and then install it. And the strategy is if those two points are done, I can set to false and they have a valid solution because um, of this part here. All the rules that have negative um, um, literals are already done so I can just set anything else to false and they have a solution. And this is the minimization part because I just, it makes 
sends to the, this is where I can must in, invest some word where I must install a package to fulfill dependencies and all, if all packages have dependencies are fulfilled then I'm basically done. That's, that's maybe the best way to explain. Okay, let's talk about policies, system policies. Um, the thing is, if I only have the look at the uh, dependencies coming from RPM, then the trivial solution is always don't install anything because if the uh, no RPM installed means no dependency broken, so we are fin we'll finished. But this is not obviously not what the user wants. <laughs> so we have system policy rules. The policy rule basically defines what to do with installed packages. Um, some policies maybe must not be deinstalled or downgraded, or must not change architecture. That's also normally what, what we in SUSE do, in OpenSUSE do. So we have installed package with a 32 bit, we just we want to keep it now say let's talk about GDC. Have a GDC with uh, I686 and the solver, if this is installed, the solver must suddenly change it to I586. So we in the we, we try we try to no, we insist that the architecture doesn't change without the user confirming it. Or a vendor changes the same thing. If the package is from SUSE, then when the repository contains a package, say, from Pac-Man, then the solver mustn't use the uh, other um, package without asking the user that it's okay to change to a different vendor. So this is, such policies are defined with policy rules, and the rule format just looks like that. You notice there's no uh, negative um, in a package in it, so this is, says either A must be installed, or A2 must be installed, or A3 must be installed, or A4 must be installed which pretty much defines the package, says to the solver, you can replace this installed package A with any of those, but that's it. So, packages with different arch or different vendor are simply not in this list, so the solver knows that it must install it. Now, normally, as I said, with those um, um, packages and the system rules you normally get um, um, unsolvable problems because maybe you want to install the newest version of Emirat which needs, a, needs some other package from, um, from the Pac-Man repository or so, so you, 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 then you get the package system is unresolvable and you want to ask the, system, the user is it okay to switch my vendor this is done with the standard um, problem reporting mechanism. And the trick is, as I said, systems without any, um, just when, when you look only at the RPM dependencies, then it's always solvable. So, if there, um, so I can turn that around. If I find that the system is unsolvable, then there must be at least one rule involved in the uh, proof. This is either a job rule, so this is user click install me that package, or erase the package or policy rule because that is this package must only be replaced with the, the, the net package. So and furthermore I can um, I get from the algorithm that all the rules involved in the um, in the uh, why it's in, it's what's not solvable well, in the contradiction. If I now break one, any one of those rules, the system, the system gets, um, this, the conflict is gone and, and the system may be solvable again. So the suggestion, solu suggested solutions is um, just do away with one of, <coughs> any one of those rules. Normally we, we just, as, we, as of this, we have um, at least one system or job rule and we can um, create suggestions by um, leaving out the, all the IPM rules because we normally don't want to uh, break RPM rules because this, this leads to an inconsistent system. Um, so we just say, ask the user, is it okay to break that job rule? Which means um, you clicked install that package. 
maybe you won't, don't want to do that and just uh, leave the old package alone or don't install that. Or maybe do away with the policy rule. That means, is it okay to uh, delete that package? Or is it okay to change a vendor? So this is, and the good thing is, the user knows all that, so it knows what's going on there. Because the user either clicked, if it's a job rule, the user either directly clicked there on that, or um, the user has also an understanding about those policy, policy rules, because they are so easy, they are just um, don't change the vendor, don't change the arch, or whatever. So this is, if the user gets the suggestions that he understands. Okay, that was basically my, my I stretched the, the surface of the algorithm, so if you are interested in more in-depth part, you have to currently have to look in the code or ask me email. The, the code is in the library called libsat solver, which is currently in the OpenSUSE factory. Um, unfortunately, as we are heavily hacking on the code, the documentation really, really uh, is not basically ex not there. Uh, how feasible is it to use it in other? Um, just. Uh, it's, 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 can, it's actually in SUSE it's used in different projects, uh, yeah. well, not, not only in the ZIP because it's, it's just a oh, ge wow. generic solving library. Well, I was more thinking like the uh, outside of the SUSE. Uh, oh, it's, it's, it would be easy to, to put in a different yeah, server. Yeah. But yeah. The library is so simple, it, it could be maybe yeah. in the Python interface, you, have, or you, yeah. you do have bindings for it. So, so you're producing your own match, and you're making a PC procedure from what is not done. Um, Adding features for you. Sorry, you, you, you fo focusing on uh, doing it like uh, feasible for nice so others can yeah, do it. Yeah, it's very oh. modular and it's generic. We try, we don't. It's not so specific. Actually, it also already contains some code about for Debian. If it wants, to, somebody wants to use it for Debian solving, because Debian has some different uh, things which provides and requires than RPM does. So, so it's it's pretty generic. And, and all the SUSE specific stuff is in LibSIP, so... And also we are working on... But that's, that's algorithmically not that interesting. We are working on a new repository uh, format to replace the XML format, which, which really makes things fast, because, um, because the, the repository files are very, very small compared to, uh, to the XML. Of course, that's, that's easy to do. <laughs> and, um, the trick is that this is dictionary based, so we have we first have a string space in, in front of the file, so we, have, we define all the strings and assign integers to the strings, so it's just string 1 is that, that and string 2 is that, and then the, all the dependency lists and so on are only list of integers, which is good because integers, um, if I have 64 bit I can still fit in 32 bit, and with, but with pointers to depend to the string that's always 64 bit, so the solving, solving doesn't take more memory if it runs on a 64-bit machine and it's string compare as the, uni, as the dictionaries get unified string compare is that easy if you do an exact compare you just compare the integer if it's the integers are the same you know the strings are the same so this is this is what's really making the new solving ellipse so fast and not really the solving but the solving too but this is much more okay any questions on the previous slide, um, just the app. Oh, wrong direction. When you're talking about um, trying to remove a rule to find a, to change from an unsolvable yep. thing into a solvable thing, if if you try removing one uh, a rule and for every rule and you still don't find a solution, could you then start removing two, or do you not try that? Um, actually, what, what happens is that. Um, there's a an, an function called refine suggestion that looks if it's now solvable and if not, and this is and adds, adds more. If, it, if, it's, if it's, it knows what to do, it it just adds more rules to remove. Because normally, if I um, delete, say, Perl or so, then I want to list all those other packages, all pack Perl packages um, don't need to be removed. And, this one will just give you one, but uh, then you click OK, and then it brings up a request the next per module, and that's not what the user writes. The user likes to see list of. So this is why the refined solutions then adds more rules to it, yes. So 
we, we, we're doing some clever things there, so that user, user interaction can be minimized. But this is more complex, too complex for that talk. <laughs> and I kept on the easy stuff here. No, other question, yeah. Um, presumably, once you've found the solution, the, the intention is that you can do a single RPM transaction to take the system to the new solved state. Yeah. Um, have you thought about, because it sometimes, because RPM is not truly transactional, like... <laughs> Jeff will be delighted to hear that. <laughs> in, in the fact that, I mean, for example, if you have, um, if, you're, if you're removing uh, an RPM and the you know the, the un uninstalled script fails or so on. Then in, in those cases, there's no easy way of reliably backtrack or rollback doing rollback. So have you thought about maybe um, doing a separate step where you, after you've got a solution that you're trying to get to, then you, you break up the, uh, the the journey to that solution into multiple smaller transactions to make the thing uh, more. Reliable. So if one if one smaller transaction fails, then the rollback is is not going to be as. To tell you the truth, um, Lipsip normally just doesn't do it in a complete RPM, but in single steps, and so it, it doesn't doesn't use RPM, RPM with one big transaction, but okay. with with uh, one feeds upon RPM after each other with minus minus plus minus minus no depths mm -hmm. to implement the transaction. So. But yeah, the, you have still have the problem that if a script fails, the other all installed RPMs normally don't have some um, downgrade script or so because uh, that wasn't something like that to, to go back edit into RPM five. The rollback basically uh, demands that the strength that either the entire transaction works or the only transaction works. So if there's a script failure, that undertakes to undo what was previously installed and put back in what was there before. Uh, the problem comes in when uh, there's scripts, there's a lot of way to write scripts. Oh yeah, okay. sure. Yeah. And uh, even if you roll back, you're not moving forward. But yeah. You really want to move forward. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the approach, there is no solvable approach. Okay. What was supposed to happen is there's sufficient QA take out the script failures and the typos and there's enough discipline. Okay. Uh, RPM goes to great lengths to compute the resolution of every file. If you know what every file is supposed to happen okay, beforehand, and there are no failures. The rest of it is just a state machine cranking away. Okay, there are exceptional failures like the disk fails in the middle or you get a power failure in the middle. These are not the interesting ones. But scripts add a whole extra dimension. Oh, great, yeah. Right. yeah. And, but breaking it down into a smaller transaction does harden it. Uh, PLD does this. Uh, and and Mandriva, uh, so. Mandriva, I'm less aware of that. Uh, it's not too hard. RPM marks levels in the tree, and so we could process subtrees as subtransactions, but don't be bothered. But, uh, but this is just the layer above it. So, so yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Doing the real installation, this is different layer. Yeah, of course. I'm not working on that. Yeah. Leave that to other folks. Have you tried integrating with RPM? Sorry? Have you tried integrating with RPM or just lives it? It's, it's just lives it. So. But feel free. <laughs> and, okay, so guys, <laughs> yeah. we're running out of time. I noticed that uh, when doing several. Any more well, questions? Doing it in many several uh, transactions instead okay. of one. Yeah. Or larger ones. Thanks.